We'll get started in just a bit. Welcome back from Labor Day weekend. Hope you had fun or you relaxed. It's 2.15, as usual. This is not gonna take all day. But we'll talk about some stuff and then see what we'll be doing in the lab and move on. Uh, this chapter covers some things that require technology and some that don't. The first one, the first item that we'll talk about is social engineering. The practice of manipulating people through a variety of strategies to accomplish desired actions. Social engineers work to influence their targets to take actions that they might not otherwise have taken. The Security Plus exam focuses on seven key principles that are leveraged to successfully social engineer an individual. Starting with authority. Most people will obey someone who appears to be in charge or knowledgeable, regardless if they actually are or not. So it's just by the look. This person looks like they're an authority figure, therefore I will listen. Another key way is intimidation. Scaring or bullying an individual into taking a desired action. So where one would be looking like a boss, uh, law enforcement or something like that, another one could be just straight up bullying. Another is consensus. People tend to do what others want to do. In doing so, it is possible to persuade a victim to take an action that they may not want, they may not have done that by themselves, but if they feel that the crowd wants to do something, they will make a compromise and do it. There is also Scarcity. Making a situation, a item, uh, more desirable because it might be the last one available. Kind of like that, um, that home sales thing of, hey, uh, oh, you're, you like this house and so did uh, three other couples who are looking to to put in a, a offer for the house. It's quickly building scarcity. There's familiarity. Relying on you liking the individual or the organization the attacker is claiming to represent. This could be like a brand name or someone that you know. Creating that familiarity will mean that uh, that trust will be established. You know, trust is a very powerful thing and if a social engineer is able 
to get you to trust them, then it's much easier for them to get you to do things that you otherwise would not have done. And the other one is urgency. Creating a feeling that the action must be taken quickly due to some reason. Such as when scammers call and say they're with the IRS and there is an arrest warrant with your name on it and they've already contacted the, the local law enforcement and they're about to execute it. If you don't do what they say, if you don't go to Walmart and, and purchase a bunch of, uh, of cards and give them the number, then that arrest warrant will be executed and you're going to be in jail. None of that is true, but they're, build, they're trying to build a sense of urgency. Bringing the seven up again. I have an infamous video. If you've seen this, then you know what's happening. If you've never seen this before, uh, you're in for a little ride. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, at gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. Oops. Isn't that fun? So these seven principles work because it causes the target to react in a situation that may make them nervous or worried about a result. Social engineering relies on human reactions when we are most vulnerable instead of thinking clearly. Social engineering efforts in the real world combine multiple principles together in a single attack, like you saw in this video. So what are some social engineering techniques? Well, one, one broad term is phishing, which was mentioned in the video. 
This is a broad term used to describe the fraudulent acquisition of information like credentials, credit card numbers, social security numbers, etc. Phishing can be done over email. It can be done over text, which is called smishing, or via phone call like you saw in that video. Spear phishing targets specific individuals or groups in an organization to gather information or access. Whaling targets senior employees, like CEOs, CFOs, etc. Get it? Because they're after a whale. Ha 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 ha. Hackers are not the best at naming things, if I haven't let you know that already. Common defenses against phishing are consistent awareness training paired with technical tools like reputation tools, keyword or text pattern matching, email scanning, call scanning, so on and so forth. Because as you see, it can be pretty, um, pretty tricky. Another technique is credential harvesting. Gathering credentials performed by phishing or system compromise or remote access trojans or any other technique. Remember that with the right credentials, an attacker can do anything to an infrastructure. Credentials are the keys to the kingdom things that you need to protect at all costs. There's website attacks. Things like farming, redirecting traffic away from legitimate websites to malicious websites. This could require a change in DNS entries, either on the local PC through like the host file or a local DNS server through things like a zone transfer or uh, compromising the DNS server. Typo squatters rely on people to mistype URLs and end up on their site. What attackers will do is take a what could be a site if a company hasn't taken it yet. For example, uh, something like, like this one, where instead of it being an L, it's the pipe uh, key. Taking this domain and then putting up something that looks like Google.com but really isn't. Or pressing a wrong key instead of Costco, using a K instead of a C. Taking that domain and putting up a fake Costco site with, act, with a way to get credentials. Or switching letters, dropping a letter, so on and so forth. If, a, if your organization has a site, it should ideally get all the possible uh, domains that anybody could type so that it ends up to you and doesn't end up going to a malicious actor. There is also in the realm of website attacks, the watering hole. It uses websites that targets frequently use. For example, a vendor. Attackers will focus on compromising those sites via malware or other means in order to reach their actual target. So if an organization was really looking into or in a, a attacking organization or group was really looking to get into a company that that makes a product like let's say a uh, micro center. Uh, they could target where they get their their components to build their servers. If it was, uh, let's say, a company that makes a piece of software, 
a malicious person or group could target things like GitHub. Find the repositories that that organ that the target organization is using and inject malware into those libraries so when the next time the developers take code to work on it, they'll also take some malware with it. Can't forget good old spam, but not that type of spam. That's spam. Spam employs social engineering to attempt to get recipients to open the message or click on the links. There is an underlying truth. If you send enough tempting messages, you are likely to have somebody fall for it. Uh, kind of outdated, but it's still in the Security Plus exam. Spam over Instant Messenger, or SPIM. You'll, you will see that in the exam, SPIM, which is Spam over Instant Messenger. There are also a few more in-person techniques. So some of these that we've covered uh, the, the have been requiring some form of technology. Here's a few that don't necessarily require technology. Dumpster diving is still a very effective information gathering technique. Retrieving potentially sensitive information from a dumpster, like documentation, manuals, notes, direct, uh, contact directories, etc. Documentation is important to, uh, for a dumpster diver because it has who's writing what. That information can be useful for a later social engineering attack. Getting manuals is also important because manuals say what type of device or software is being used. A lot of people tend to throw away those manuals after they assembled the, the component or device or software. But that information is very critical because now we know what what they have. Notes is definitely uh, useful. A lot of people jot down their ideas, jot down uh, you know, what they're working on, and then just throw it away without properly destroying it. Contact directories would help with spoofing because now we know what people work there, what their contact information is, so now we can pretend to be that person. Shoulder surfing is looking over a person's shoulder to capture information like credentials or any other data. It doesn't necessarily have to be over the shoulder. This could also be looking with a mirror, with binoculars, in any other form, even if it's uh, kind of like this picture where there's two people sitting on a on what looks like a, either a bus or a uh, subway, if the lady was sitting next to the window, you could be looking at what she's doing through the reflection of the window. Privacy screens, which are not that expensive, and user awareness are ways to fight shoulder surfing. You know, don't log on to the company organization. Uh, without having a privacy screen on so that nobody sees what you're doing. Tailgating is a physical entry attack that requires simply following someone who has authorized access to an area so that as they open secured doors, you can pass through as well.
a very simple way that ladies can get can uh, make this work is uh, I've seen it before is people is ladies pretending to be pregnant and asking if they can use the restroom. That tends to be a surefire way to get through. Because you have that you have that peer pressure of oh are you gonna not let a pregnant lady through? Are you gonna be a jerk? But you don't know if they are or not, and they could be a trespasser. It could be somebody trying to social engineer just by simply pretending to be something that they're not. Eliciting information is a technique to gather information without targets realizing they are providing it through things like flattery, false ignorance, acting as a counselor or a sounding board. Elicitation targets usually realize they provided more information that they intended to give after the fact. So getting someone to build trust build familiarity, will probably get them to say more than they should, and they won't realize it until it's too late. Which again, the best way to combat this is training and awareness. Will it work 100% of the time? No. But we will do our part in helping prevent these things from happening. Identity fraud, pretending to be someone else, is definitely a key tool that can be used for malicious purposes. We have pretexting, process of using a made up scenario to justify why you are approaching an individual. It's used to make impersonation efforts more believable. Easy way to defeat pretexting? A verification call. This per this random person came up to you with a scenario justifying why uh, you are approaching a specific person. Well, let me go call that person and find out. There's identity a fraud and theft, typically used for financial gain or used as part of a penetration test. This can be anything from pretending to be a delivery driver or an employee of a service provider like an ISP or the water or power rather than a very specific identity. Because how often have you verified that the cable guy really is a cable guy? Anybody can go to Central Computers or Home Depot or Lowe's and get all the the right bag, the right uniform. Like all that stuff is easy to buy. You know, easy to 3D print a badge. That that's not complicated. It just takes a little bit of time and money. But what's when's the last time you actually confirmed that that person works for that company? Hoaxes are a common occurrence. And invoice scams, sending fake invoices to organizations in hopes of receiving payment is another type of fraud. Happens a lot where uh, business offices get inundated with invoices and they just, they just do them all without really stopping and going, wait a minute, is this someone who we've actually done business with? Uh, this normally works in times like the holidays or end of fiscal year. When in holidays, everybody wants to get out. They just want to get through all their work. They'll, they'll have their guard less up than usual and just get everything through.
have to keep an eye out for those things. As cyber warfare and traditional warfare have continued to cross over, online influence campaigns have become a part of hybrid warfare. These can turn public opinion in directions of their choosing, from advertisement, disinformation campaigns, propaganda. We know, we see this all the time. Moving on to attacks on the one type of authentication that we use pretty much everywhere, passwords. Brute force attacks iterate through passwords until they find one that works. The actual methods can be more complex than just using a list of passwords, often involving word lists that common user passwords uh, words specifically picked as likely used by the target, modification rules to help account for uh, complexity rules. Brute force is a process that involves trying different variations until it succeeds. Password spraying is a form of brute force that attempts to use a single password or small set of passwords against many accounts. It can be effective if a target uses specific passwords against many accounts. For example, a sports team's fan sites tend to use a common chant, well-known player names, or common terms related to the team. Dictionary attack is another form of brute force using a list of words. Password attacks can be online against a live system that may have defenses in place or offline against a compromised password store. Rainbow tables can easily search through their databases of pre-computed hashes to find passwords. As long as you're able to get the hash from a machine, you can either take it to a set of rainbow tables or you could take it to something like Hashcat with a strong enough GPU or a number of GPUs and be able to break quite a variety of passwords. Lastly, I have three physical attacks. Starting with malicious flash drives, penetration testers and attackers may drop these drives in locations where they are likely to be picked up and plugged in by unwitting victims, sometimes labeled with compelling text like performance reviews, financial planning, or other key tempting words. These are effectively a physical Trojan. There's malicious USB cables effectively invisible attack method that is able to interface with the computer to record keystrokes or capture data in addition to deploying malware. There are lots of these out and about that you can buy for cheap and set to become key loggers, set to become data extractors. They look just like any other cable that you would have be careful next time you just you need to plug in your phone to charge make sure that it's a, a a legitimate cable normally by bringing your own you know where it's been you know where you got it from you know that it is not compromised if you don't know where the cable's been don't use it
Here's uh, another. Card cloning. Capturing information from RFID and magnetic stripe cards for entry access. Attackers can also conduct skimming attacks that use hidden or fake readers to capture, otherwise known as skim, cards and employ cloning tools to use credit cards and entry access cards for their own purpose. So I'll run through these pictures one more time so you kind of get a better look. Here is a device that you would use to pay with. The safe one doesn't go as in. The suspicious one does. Here's a suspicious and safe uh, card swiper that you might find at, say, your grocery store. The suspicious one is wider than the actual one. That's because this would go on top of the real one and would skim. Not only would it record the information, but it would also pass it over to the real one so that tr the transaction goes through. In another way, if this way isn't so clear, another way of looking at them and, and wondering if it's real or not, do the keys light up? Because these keys tend to light up for you every time you're about to use it. If it doesn't light up as much, it might be suspicious. So give it a yank to see if something, if the top part comes off. If so, then hey, you got yourself a skimmer. Any questions or did I just scare the bejesus out of all of you? Cool, cool. Well, this week's work is not as crazy as last week's. This week, you'll jump onto Try Hack Me and complete at least three rooms that relate to the topics we discussed, like password cracking. Here in this screenshot, I provided you some examples that you can use. I don't know when rooms go up and down. Sometimes the creators of the rooms remove the ones that they worked on and they're no longer available. So rather than specifically assigning a certain room to work on, because again, it could change, I decided to give you some examples that as long as they're there, you are welcome to use. Uh, once they're gone, well, they're gone. But you have some example of what you could use uh, to submit. So all you have to do is complete the room, show proof that you completed it. You need to do that at least three times. Any questions? on the work this week. Okay, I'm um, seeing none then. I will end the live stream.